Hey, it's good to see you this morning. We don't need to get hung up by a video, but uh, we are in a new series. Actually, it started last week with Pastor Weaver. We just kind of got caught up with it, and, and uh, uh, it's called This Is Us, and it's really we're talking about uh, the principle of everyone that uh, it's all of us. We're part of a body. We're part of a family. And God has given us all uh, responsibilities, and we're here for, for each other. We're here for everyone. There's some things uh, that make us unique as a church at New Hope. And uh, through this series, we're going to highlight that. And uh, we're going to challenge you a little bit, hopefully, uh, what it means for us to be uh, a, a church, what it means to be the body of Christ, not just here in this setting, in this building, but uh, what happens when we, go, when we go out here. What's that? Gotcha. It's on my notes. We are going to do a dollar blessing this morning. So if the guys can help me out. This morning we're uh, receiving a, a dollar blessing from Mary Long. Mary uh, had her apartment building uh, at the Plum Apartments uh, burnt down. If you watched the news or saw that last Saturday, uh, second time in eight years that that complex has had a building burned down and Mary lived there. And uh, so we're going to do a dollar blessing uh, for her. If you're new to, new to our church, uh, we do this pretty, pretty often where somebody has a need and we all just pitch in. There's no coercion. Nobody has to do it. Don't feel like because somebody's pulling out money next to you that you've got to be part of it. But it's an opportunity that we have to be a blessing to other people uh, in our family, in our church, in our fellowship. And uh, this would bless Mary. She lost everything in the fire. So... Um, Thank you for being a church that loves one another and cares for each other. And uh, this really is a privilege that we have to be part of, uh, of these dollar blessings to bless people. Last week, Pastor Weaver preached a message called In and Out. And if you look throughout Scripture, there are, there are a number of Scriptures that refer to this uh, idea of, of going out and coming in. And all through Old Testament, New Testament, we see glimpses of that. And last week he really spent his time focusing on coming in. And uh, today the title of the message is, is going out. There's a verse in 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 7 that says, Now, O Lord, this is Solomon speaking, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Yet I am but a little child. I don't know how to go out or come in. Going out and coming in, we found out last week, is a, is a military term referring to, to war. And um, we know that we're daily in a spiritual battle. And you've probably experienced that there is an enemy. Uh, for us as Christians, there is an enemy. His name's Satan. And uh, he would like nothing more than to affect God's plans, his purposes uh, in, in our lives. And he's not going to give up and he's not going to quit. He's not going to sleep. Uh, we're engaged in this battle as long as we're here on this, on this earth. And it's not something to lose, lose heart over because we know that God is greater than him, that he's already won that battle. Anything that Satan is going to try to us, Jesus is able to overcome that. He overcame death, hell, and the grave. And we have Christ uh, on our side. He's in our life. His spirit is in us. So there's nothing that the enemy can do to us uh, that, is gonna, that gives us any, any reason to worry uh, but we've got to be aware that we're engaged in a battle. So we need to, we need to understand this whole idea of, of coming in and going out. So we, we learned that coming in really is about worship. When we talk about coming in here, like today we came in, we came in to worship the Lord. And I, I don't know about you, but I sense the presence of the Lord in our, in our worship this morning. And as I just kind of glimpse, I try not to look around too much, but I just kind of catch a glimpse across this way because I'm sitting over here and I see people you know, with their, with their hands raised in worship. And really, it's our opportunity to really come in and receive from the Lord. And we can worship Him, and we should be worshiping Him throughout our, throughout our week, throughout our days. It's not that it's just confined to this building, but there's something amazing when we gather together. And so when we come, we come, and even some of the lyrics that we sing, we come expecting there's something different that happens when you come expecting something. Have you ever noticed that when you're looking for something and you're expecting to see something, it's a lot more easier for you to see it. You ever see those pictures where there's a hidden, there's a hidden picture inside of a bigger picture? You know, it's easy just to look, look past that and go, oh, it's just another picture. But when, you, when there's something hidden in that picture, you're looking, you're, you're looking into it, you're looking through it and trying to find 
what is there. And I, on the surface, you know, we can come here and have a great experience, a time of worship, um, and, and say, oh, the music was great, and, you know, I saw some people lifting their hands. But if we're, we're missing an opportunity ourselves, if we're not engaging, because we, we, we need to come in so that God can fill us up with his spirit, it gets pretty dry living, living outside these walls. How many of you find that to be true? It's the battle. And we need times where we can come in to be, to be refreshed, to be encouraged. Uh, the, some of the lyrics of the song, I wrote them down in the early service this morning. If we truly, truly mean the words that, and, and I know there's somebody else's words on the screen and we're singing them, but if we can, we can truly make these our words, it's your heart we're searching for. We want you and nothing more. Is that, is that really what your heart's desire is? Did you come this morning seeking and searching for Jesus? We surrender all to you. Do what you want to in my life. Do you mean that? How many of you want God to do in you what he wants to do? Don't raise your hand just because other people are raising your hand. But if you truly, honestly want God to do in your life what he wants for you, okay, we come and we expect and we receive and God has a a plan and a purpose. We sing, you're good. And you're never going to let me down. He's never going to let go of us. He's never going to let us down. God is a faithful God and he is good. And it's good for us to say that. It's good for us to sing that. It's good for us to remind ourselves that the God that we serve, the God that we love, the God that we know is a good God. And he has good things for us. We live in a world where there's a lot of things that aren't so good. And sometimes people get that mixed up going, how can, how can God be good when I see all this going on out there? How can God be good when I'm facing this kind of stuff? Well, the fact is, is he's good. He doesn't change. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to let you go. He is a faithful God. And so as we come in, we come in and we receive from the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to be talking about going out. But I want to ask you this question to start with. What would happen to a person who says this? You know, I, this whole coming and going out thing, I would rather just come in. And if I could, I would spend my time coming in and being in the presence of God. I just want to be with God so much. What I want to do is spend my time worshiping Him. I'm not going to go out anymore. I just want to spend my time worshiping the Lord in His presence. Would you agree that that is a good thing? Some people are shaking their head yes. Some people are shaking their head no. How could you ever go wrong with the presence of God. But the, but the condition was, I'm just going to come in, and I'm just going to be here, and I'm just going to be in his presence. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. No more going out. I, I, I experienced this as a youth pastor for many years. Every time we would take kids to camp, and it would happen uh, it, 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 countless times where kids would come up to me at the end of a week of camp and say, Pastor Jeff, can we just stay here? And I get that. There's some experiences that happen in a week of camp in a, in, a, in a middle school or a high school student's life where God meets them there. All the distractions and the things of life are, are just kind of set on the shelf and it's not part of the everyday life at camp. And you're there, you've got church in the morning, church in the evening. You play hard, you pray hard. Uh, it's just an experience and God has an opportunity to just pour in their lives. And I get it would be fun to stay there. But I don't want to stay there for the whole rest of the year, like they would say. I I got a family that I go home, and I want to go home and be with my family. And the reality is, is, as much as we want to stay in those times and be in God's presence, he has has a plan for us to go out. And that's important that we do that. It sounds like a really good thing to just only be coming in. But it's not a good plan because God designed us. Us. He designed me, he designed you to be a river, not a reservoir. God wants to fill us up. God wants to flow into us, but he, he, wants, us to, he wants to flow through us. What God gives us, he doesn't intend for us to hold on to. He intends for it to flow through us to other people. He intends to pour in us so he can pour through us and do his work and his, accomplish his purpose and his mission in the world. He wants to fill us up. 
I was reminded as I was studying about this of a place up in Johnson. Some of you might live in the area or drive by this on Northwest 70th Street. Uh, it's just east of 100th Street. There's Renee's uh, Greenhouse. I don't know if, the, if you're familiar with Johnston or Grimes. You drive through that area. But there's a house that sits there back off the street, and there's a big pond in front of it. How many of you know where I'm talking about? And that pond is like covered with moss and guck and scum. Somebody said, that's algae. It is algae, but it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a, you know, I've had people say, you know the house with the pond, the, the, the green pond. <laughs> okay, obviously it's a stagnant pond, and I don't know a whole lot about this, but I know that stagnant water happens when something can, water can come into it, but it doesn't have a place to go out of it, okay? And so that's what happens if we're just coming in all the time, we become stagnant, and we want our focus to go upward, but what happens when we're coming in and we're not going out is it doesn't go upward, our focus comes inward, and we begin to think more about ourself. We get to be focused on, on ourself and what we want. Really, a stagnant, stagnant water is really an environmental hazard. It's a, it's, a, it's a mess, and it's a problem, and I don't want that to be for us or for us as a church or, or individuals. God designed us to receive and to give. And when we stop giving, when we stop reaching out, when we stop ministering, we become stagnant and we're in trouble. So Solomon says back in, um, in 1 Kings, he says, I don't know how to do what my father did. He knew how to come in and, and go out. He's talking about David, his father. And David was a man who knew how to worship. David knew how to witness. David was a man, the Bible says, after God's own heart. What we know about David is David is a warrior. David, uh, who killed a, a, a bear, a lion with his own bare hands. David, who has said in Scripture, uh, uh, King Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed tens of thousands, okay? David was known to be a warrior, but he was also a worshiper. He not only knew how to go out, he knew how to come in. David is said uh, in many places that David worshiped God with all of his heart. David worshiped God with all of his might. David danced before the Lord and uh, such that he didn't care what it looked like or who was watching. He wanted to worship his God. David, who wrote the majority of the Psalms that we have, which are really songs of worship to the Lord. But David had a moral failure. And the Bible tells us why, and it has something to do with this going out and coming in. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, it says this, Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings do what? When kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David stayed in Jerusalem. Instead of going out, David sent, and David remained. He stayed back at Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, when the evening came, David arose from his bed. He walked around on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. If you read the New King James Version, verse 2, it starts out like this. It says, then it happened. This is when it happened. It happened when David arose from his bed. See, he was taking a nap in the afternoon and he saw Bathsheba. Let me ask you a question. Would David had, have even seen Bathsheba had he been where he was supposed to be? If David had gone out when he was supposed to go out, instead of staying in, he would have never seen Bathsheba in the first place, and a lot of the history would change. See, David was a man who knew how to come in, and he knew how to go out, but David stopped going out. He had a moment where he stopped going out. Why is that bad? It's because God designed us uh, to come in and to go out. And like I said, when we, stop, when we stop giving, when we stop ministering, when we stop witnessing and sharing our faith with people, we begin to turn inward not upward, we start looking, like I said, to get our own needs met. We're by very nature selfish people. We look at most things in life of what, what does this do for me? How can I benefit from this? We can see that in a, in a lot of different ways, but I was just thinking about this. We had a, 
we had a, a preaching series that we did back in, um, in October on Sunday evenings on the end times. And it's interesting because through that series, about three or four weeks of, of, of messages on the end times, we uh, probably doubled or more than doubled our attendance on Sunday night. There's, there's a, a desire or something in us that says, I need to know about that. I want to know about that. that I, I can see how you know, I'm interested in that. I benefit from that. But we, we, we announced that we're having a baby dedication service. You know, we used to have baby dedications on Sunday morning, but our church has gotten so big that we are having baby dedications more than half of the Sunday mornings. And that's great. It's awesome. We've got a growing church. We've got babies being born, but uh, we thought it might just be more efficient to do this. And I, I, I get it. We have a dedication service on Sunday night, and um, they're saying, that's not, that's not for me. It's not really going to, I'm not really going to get anything out of that. I, I, I understand that except for the fact that this is your church. And these are, these are parents and families that are coming to dedicate their children. They're making a commitment to God and to their family and to their church to raise these children to follow God. They need you. These young families dedicating their children, they need every one of you. And you say, they don't, they don't even know who I am. I don't know who they are. They need to know you, and you need to know them. They need your encouragement. They need your support. They need your prayer, your love, your help to help them fulfill the God-given responsibility that they have and that they have taken on to raise their children, to know God, to, to love him, to serve him all the days of their, their life. I'm not trying to bring any condemnation. I, I'm just saying we've got to think bigger picture. We oftentimes, too oftentimes, we think about me and myself and what I need and what I want. God wants us to look out. You might be thinking about this series, this series, This Is Us, and think, okay, we're talking about the things about what we are as new. Is this stuff I already know? Most likely it probably is. Stuff you've already heard, I'm sure it's some, most all of you have heard this before. Tomorrow, this morning we're talking about going out, we're talking about reaching out, we're talking about evangelism, us going and doing the work. How many of you have heard a message on that before? Okay, you've been around long enough, you know, <laughs> you know it, right? Except for the fact that when we come into God's presence like this and we hear a message, God speaks to us. And we need God to speak to us. And just because you've heard something before doesn't mean you can't hear it again. I know some of you, you watch the same movies over and over and over. How many of you have ever listened to the same song more than once? Okay. Where do, we, where do we think that we can't hear a topic more than once, okay? There, I understand it's a big book. There's a lot of stuff in here. But this morning, would you, would you open your heart and just say, God, what is, what is it that you want from me? And every time we come into this building, think about, God, what is it that you're speaking to me on my journey, what you want me to do, what's the next step, what should I, what should I be doing? But the nature for us is to think about ourselves first. But the reality is, is our, our, me, our needs are met by giving. Scripture says, give and it'll be given to you. It's a biblical principle. You reach out to others, it's going to do something for you. We've got a, a, a team of uh, people going to Haiti in just a couple of weeks and uh, be praying for them. There's some, there's some needs that they have in the bulletin. If you can help in that way, that'd be awesome. Just being a part of helping that team go. But there's a lot of them that are going who've been before. They went and they saw, hey, there is a need here. And their heart just, it, it, it goes out to that, that area. I've taken so many mission trips with students and adults to inner cities or to um, Indian reservations, to third world countries. And without exception, we go, we prepare, we go to give, we go to serve and, uh, and, and, and receive nothing back. But I will tell you without exception, the testimonies that I hear back from people that have gone on these trips are, I went to give, but I feel like I received so much more. How many of you have experienced that on a mission trip, on a ministry trip? It's the reality of what happens. When we give, it comes back to us. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Some of your Bibles, it may say the parable of the great banquet. Mine says Jesus tells the parable of the great feast. I think this could be the parable of great excuses. Could have titled the message this morning, Excuses, Excuses. 
Verse 15 of Luke chapter 14, let's read through this parable. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. One of the disciples, whoever it was that was sitting there, he said, won't it be great? Won't it just be the greatest thing when someday we're eating this meal, we're sharing this feast, having this banquet in heaven with you? I can just, I can just picture that happening. And Jesus answers with this. It says, verse 16, he replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master, and the owner of the house became very angry and ordered his servant, go out, go out. You catch that? Go out quickly into the streets and alleyways of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, what? Go out. Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. There were three excuses in this parable. Excuses that don't really make a whole lot of sense. You see, these were people who had already accepted the invitation. They were just waiting to hear that the banquet was ready to happen. And so the servant went out to tell them it's time for the banquet. And, and he says to the first one, uh, the banquet's ready. And he says, uh, I just bought a field. I need to go see it. How many of you ever bought land without seeing it first? Anybody? Okay. The next guy says, ah, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I need to go try them out. Does that, does that make a whole lot of sense? How many of you bought a car without test driving it before? I got my hand raised because I bought two of them. So I, uh, <laughs> I have two vehicle purchases on eBay, and uh, I, I will tell you that it's probably one of the best buying experiences that I ever had. But there is a little bit of sense of trepidation of, flying in an airplane to Dallas, Texas to uh, get a ride to a place where the car is that I bought already. I've already paid for it. I haven't seen it. I haven't heard it. I have, I have no idea about it, but they both turn out to be great experiences. But that's just not something that we do. We go to try something out, right? You don't, most of the time you go, you buy clothes, you try them on before you even, before you even buy them to take them home. We like to do that. This is, the excuses here don't really fit. I mean, I just, I bought a field, I've got to go right now to go see it. Because maybe it's not going to be there, or somebody might take it. I mean, what's going to happen? What's, you know, what does that excuse really mean? Or I've, I've got to go right now to try out these oxen. And do you hear the, 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 uh, the third one says, I just got married. In the New Living Translation, it says, I, 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 um, I just got a wife so I can't go. I now have a wife. I can't come. <laughs> These banquets were, were incredible, over-the-top amazing. Hard for us to fully understand the significance of what one of these banquets would have been alike because you see most of us uh, we've been to banquets and uh, we can go we can go to grocery stores there's a lot of stores around we there's a lot of nice restaurants that we can go and get some nice food but the people that Jesus was talking to wouldn't have been like that you see the diets that they had would have been pretty pretty simple Probably it would have been the same thing day after day after day. And what they would serve or make up for a meal would probably be just enough to feed a family. Just enough to get by. And so as he's talking about this illustration of a banquet, uh, it got their attention. 
you know, he's talking about the, the choicest of foods and, and lots of it. It's a banquet you go to and you can eat as much as you want. You just go and pig out, kind of like a cruise, if any of you have been on a cruise. All right? So um, the disciples were hearing this parable. They're probably thinking, this is like the most absurd illustration ever. I mean, who in their right mind is going to turn down a banquet just to go look at a field? Think about this, this young guy that just, just got a wife. You know, they come and they say, hey, the banquet's ready. You and your wife can come. Yeah, I just got a wife. I can't come. So what is he really saying? Is he saying, okay, think about this. I know there's probably some people in the room who are fairly new in their marriage, but some of you, most of you have probably been married quite a while, so you're going to have to remember and think back to the time when you first got married. And so he's turning down a banquet so that he can stay home and eat his young wife's, newly married wife, whatever she's going to make for him. Some of you are good cooks, but it just reminds me of a story. Um, when Gina and I had just been married maybe, maybe a month We've been married uh, maybe a couple months. And um, Jeannie, Jeannie we, we lived in a duplex, and there was an apple tree in the yard of this duplex. And the landlord said, you can, you can have all the apples that you want. And so Jeannie did, like, the most amazing thing. She made me an apple pie. And so I, I, I had eaten on this pie for a couple of days. I probably ate half of the pie. And uh, one of her friends from school came over to, to, to hang out with Jeannie for a little while. And Jeannie offered a piece of pie. I think she took one bite of that pie and said, this is the most awful thing I've ever tasted in my life. <laughs> and I think Jeannie's scratching her head a little bit going, Jeff's already eaten half of it. And she's like, why did you eat that pie? And I said, well, it wasn't because it was good. <laughs> She forgot to put sugar in it. So <laughs> I ate the pie because my wife had done something amazing for me. She made me a pie, and I was gonna, not going to tell her that it wasn't good. But after Krista said it wasn't good, I don't think I had any more of it. <laughs> but I can tell you that she's learned how to make pies, and she makes a lot of great, great things. So i got to redeem myself a little bit there. But imagine the excuse of this guy going, I'd, I'd choose my, my newly married wife's cooking over the banquet. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense. And the point that Jesus is trying to teach through all this is that any excuse to not accept Christ is foolish. Any excuse, it's, it's just crazy. But you see, lost people come up with all kinds of excuses why not to follow Christ. People will come up with any kind of excuse uh, imaginable to say, I, I can't come to church with you. And I, I, we don't have time to go through all those excuses, but you're, you're already rehearsing some of the things that you've heard and maybe some things that you used to use. How many of you have heard this excuse? Probably one of the more popular ones of, uh, I, I don't want to go to church because there's a lot of hypocrites there. How many of you have heard that before? There are a lot of hypocrites everywhere. There are a lot of hypocrites at the grocery store when you go to the grocery store. Larry, there's a lot of hypocrites on the golf course. A lot of hypocrites on the golf course. There's hypocrites at ball games. There's hypocrites wherever you go. Maybe you've heard this. It, it'd be better to spend a few years with hypocrites in church than to spend eternity in hell with them. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about hypocrites. You read it sometime and see what their end is. But a hypocrite is basically someone who pre professes to be something that they're not. They profess to be a Christian, but they're not. So someone making the excuse for not coming to church or following Jesus because of hypocrites is basically saying, okay, I just want to throw my life away because I saw some counterfeit Christian. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's kind of like if you saw me and I'm throwing all my money, I'm, I'm just... All my cash is going out the window, and you say, Pastor Jeff, what are you throwing all the money out the window for? And I say, well, I saw some counterfeit money, so I thought I'd get rid of all of my good money. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Excuses are just what they are. They're excuses. And so as we, as we go out and we're witnessing, we're, we're sharing our faith, we're giving testimony, we encounter all kinds of excuses. And the master said, 
Master said this, verse 23, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. This word compel is a pretty strong word. Some of your versions say constrain them or urge them or persuade them or make them to come. The word compel means to to force or oblige someone to do something. So go out and force them to come back. It means to bring about by the use of force or pressure to drive forcibly. So the idea is you got somebody by by their arm and you've got it twisted behind their back and you're going to make them go where you want them to go. This is a great evangelism strategy, you guys, I'm telling you. <laughs> but this, but this, this idea of compelling them, he's compelling them to go and compel the people. It's what Jesus said, and what he's, what he's saying this, in this, he's saying, I want you to go out, and I want you to constrain people. I want you to bring them in. I'm glad that you're coming in, and I want you to come in. But while there's still time, I need you to go out because there are people out there that need to come in. They don't know that they need to come in. You need to tell them and constrain them and persuade them to come in. This guy sitting around the table at the beginning of this parable saying, hey, won't it just be so great when we get to sit and have this feast together with you in heaven? And honestly, I don't think Jesus' thought was all the people that were going to be with him. His first thought was all those people that weren't going to be there. That's where this parable comes from. And what he's saying is, okay, they're, they're not here for, for one reason. Maybe they've made an excuse. Maybe another reason is because nobody's gone and invited them. Go out and get them to come in while there's still time. Jesus said in John 9, 4, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We love that. But it goes on to say, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they ever hear about him unless someone tells them? And how can someone tell them unless they're sent out? We are have been sent out. We are sent ones by God. He's called us to go. Mark 16, 15 says, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. We think Jesus' last words were go, but they really weren't go. He did tell us to go. He said, this is my mission for all of you, to go into all the world and to tell the good news to everyone. But actually, the last words that Jesus said before he, before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples in Acts, he said, go and wait. Remain in Jerusalem until the gift of my Father comes. We read in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, through Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. God has called us all to go out but we're not ready to go out until we first come in. We have nothing to go out with if we haven't first come in to receive his presence, to worship him, to receive from him. We have to come in, but the but the reason for our coming in is for the purpose of going out. We come in so that we can go out, so that we can compel them, so that we can constrain them. The problem is, is that the same way that lost people make excuses for coming to Christ, we make excuses for not going out. Already in your mind, you might have been formulating or you're rehearsing some things that you are already, it's kind of your mode of operation. Excuses. I don't know how to talk to people. I'm too busy. That's not my thing. I don't have all the answers. I don't have a good testimony. Isn't that the pastor's job? All kinds of excuses for us not going out. And here's the thing. We make witnessing a whole lot bigger deal than it really is. We make it a whole lot more difficult than it really is. Witnessing is very simple and it's very easy. And it happens very naturally. 
unless we stop it. You see, witnessing is simply talking about someone that you love. When someone falls in love with another person, what do they do? You spend time with them. I, uh, I remember, you know, th- through the years, teenagers being so, like, upset and almost disgusted. You know, their best friend now has a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and now they are spending all their time with him or her. Not, not hanging out with us anymore. They, you know, they're, now we're low on the, now they're spending all their time with them. And whenever they do spend time with us, what are they doing? Talking about them. You know what they're doing? They're witnessing. They're telling about their experience. That's what witnessing really is. To be a witness, you just tell your story. A witness is simply someone who tells what they saw or what they experienced. If you've got a witness in a court, in a courtroom, in a court proceeding, what do they do? They're not there to tell what the other person saw. They're there to tell what I, I'm here to say what I saw, what I experienced, what happened to me. This is my story. It might be a little bit different from a person that saw it from the other angle. This is my story. I can't tell somebody else's story. I can only say what I saw. I can only tell you what I experienced. That's it. That's what a witness does. There's a story in John chapter 4. You can read it later. I'm not going to take the time to read that scripture. But in John chapter 4, Jesus has an encounter with a woman at the well. It was a Samaritan woman. And um, it says that he was weary, he was tired, his disciples went into town to get some food. And along comes this woman, a Samaritan woman, and Jesus asks her for a drink. And immediately she starts, you know, trying to throw some distractions. She's like, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew. I'm a woman. Why are you talking to me? And he talks to her about about water, and he talks about living water, that she would never thirst again. This water, this physical water, you'll thirst again, but I've got water that, that you know nothing of, that you can experience this living water, and you'll never thirst again. And she says, I, I, I see that you don't even have a bucket. This is a deep well. You don't even have a rope to, to get water. What, well, and so through this conversation, Jesus is just simply telling his story with her. We see through the conversation here, you, of course, you know, Jesus uh, is, is God's son, but he's able to say some things to this woman that she's going, how did you know that? And, he, and, and it just, it, it surprises her so much so it says that she left her stuff at the, at the well and she went back into town and she began to tell everybody about this experience with this guy at the well. She says, there's a guy out here, you've got to come see him. He's told me everything about myself. He knows all about my marriages and the fact that I'm living with a guy right now and I'm not even married. Do you think that this could be Messiah? It's, a, it's an interesting story. And what, you know, she, he, he goes from telling his story to her and she goes and tells her story to the people in town. And it, and it tells us that they, they come to the well too. And they say, because you told us, yeah, we came and we see that it's exactly as you said. And, and, and lots of lives are changed and affected because people are just telling their story. That's what we're supposed to do. We're to go out and we're to be witnesses. We don't go on our own. We go with the Holy Spirit and with his power. There's a, a, another story of Jesus healing a blind man in John chapter 9. And uh, this, this man had been blind from the time of birth. And uh, Jesus does a miracle and heals this guy. And they're all just like confused. Isn't this, this guy looks like the guy who used to beg at the gate. This is the guy, he looks like him, but that guy's blind. This guy can see. So they're trying to figure out what happened. He said, all I can tell you is this guy put mud on my face. I washed it off, and now I can see. They, they're, so, they're so disturbed by what's going on, they bring his parents in and they say, wasn't your son blind? And they, they begin to question them and, and kind of put them to the test, and they, they finally get to the point of saying, why don't you talk to him? He's old enough, he can answer. Well, we've already talked to him. The whole thing gets kind of ridiculous, and all he, all he can say is this, here's what I can tell you. This is the way I was before, 
He put some mud on my eyes, and now I can see. That's my story. All I know is I was blind, and now I see. He's just simply telling his story. He's being a witness to what happened to him. We get so hung up on this whole idea of going out and doing evangelism, of constraining people and bringing people in. It's really pretty simple. While we're here and in our own time, we connect with God. And he pours his spirit and his love in us, and it can flow through us if we're not just holding it on to ourselves. He wants to use you. He wants to use you to reach those people. You look around you right here. There's more people in this service than there was in the early service, but do you see some open seats? Are there some open, open seats where somebody could sit by you? Is there somebody that you know that could fill one of those seats? See, our intention here has never been, Pastor Weaver says it all the time, our intention here is not to build a big church. But it's grown. And it hasn't grown because we've been on TV advertising or on the radio or doing big spreads in the newspaper or anything like that. We, until five years ago, we moved into this building five years ago this month. We used to be in, in the building across on Townsend. And most of the people even in Urbandale didn't even know that church was there. And we didn't advertise, but it grew. How did it grow? People told other people people's lives got changed and transformed and they begin to tell other people it was a word of mouth thing we can get to a place where we say i'm happy i'm happy like it is and we don't we don't need more people but the reality is is jesus's first thought was all the people that aren't going to be there is that our thought we can become satisfied with what we have and what we're going to become is stagnant We're going to become that murky, mucky, stagnant, environmental hazard pond. And I don't want to be that way. But it only happens because not only are we coming in, but we're going out. And here's the thing. There is somebody out there that needs you. There's people that you work with, people that you go to school with. There's people in your neighborhood. There's people in your family. And I'm not saying you've got to take them by the arm and drag them here, put them in handcuffs and make them come here. But your story can compel them. Your testimony, your words. Here's the deal, we get hung up on testimony, but you know what? We live in a world of testimony. Some of you shop online. I did most of my Christmas shopping online, on Amazon, a few other websites. Guess how I shop on Amazon? With testimonies. I don't buy something unless it has a good, good review, right? Guess what a testimony is? It's a review. How are you reviewing God? How are you reviewing your church? How are you reviewing your life? Here's the deal. We have an opportunity to make a difference. Our life should be a light. We're salt. We're light. We're called to go. Jesus said in that same chapter, John chapter 4, look out at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. It's our job to go out and bring them in. Would you bow your heads with me as the musicians come? With your head bowed and your eyes closed, the first thing that I want to ask you this morning is this. Are you making excuses? Are you at a place where you become stagnant? Are you at a place where there's things that you know you should do, but you're just making excuses? And it could be that you've been making excuses for giving your life to Christ. This morning, you know that there's, there really is no excuse Jesus truly is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Jesus died on the cross. He gave his life for you because he loves you. And he's thinking about you, the one who's not sitting at his banquet table. He cares about you. He loves you. And he wants you to give your life to him. There's no excuse. That excuse is going to keep you on the outside, and someday he's going to return, and you won't be there. Will you open your heart and your life to him today? Is there anyone in the room that would say, no more excuses, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I know that he is the answer to my life. I've come here today seeking. I've come here today searching. I know that the way I've been doing is, it's not the way. And today I'm opening my life and I'm giving my life to Jesus. Thank you.
Looking across the room, thank you. Anyone else? It's really just saying yes to Jesus and what he's done for you and what he's made available to you, which is the hope of eternal life, forgiveness of your sin and a life of freedom. And to the rest of you today who uh, are sitting here, you, you, you love coming in. You love coming to church. You're here today. You love worship. And you know, you live with this idea that I'm supposed to go out and I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be a witness. I'm supposed to give testimony. I'm supposed to do these things because there's lost people out there, but there's some excuse, there's some barrier that's keeping you from doing that. But this morning you realize that your excuses are just that, they're excuses. That there's no excuse for the purpose and plan of God for your life. As much as he wants you to come in, he wants you to go out. He wants your life to be a testimony. And it's really a matter of this, living with the perspective that God has a mission and a plan for me, and there's something or someone that he wants me to touch. There's some person that he wants me to reach. And I may not be twisting their arm, but I can love them. I can get to know them and build relationship with them to see God have an opportunity to work in their life. And this morning, you'd raise your hand saying, I'm making a new commitment to be a person who not only comes in, but on a mission to go out. That when I leave here today, I know that God can and will and wants to use me. And you haven't been doing that, or you're making a new commitment to say, this year, this is gonna be my plan. I'm gonna let my life be a witness. I'm gonna let my light shine. I'm gonna let my word speak. I'm gonna let my life be action. And I'm gonna go and do whatever God wants me to do. I said this morning, I want him to do what he wants to in my life. And I'm raising my hand to say, that's my commitment today. Across the room, if that's your commitment, would you raise your hand? God, I wanna do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. I'm yours, God. Use me. Would you stand this morning? Hands are all across the room this morning. Let's make this commitment, uh, not not just a raising of a hand, but words from our mouth. We can use this song this morning that says, I'll go, I'll be your hands, I'll go, I'll be your feet. I'll go and let the light of Jesus shine through my life and I'm gonna make a difference. I wanna see Jesus' name proclaimed through my life.